So yeah, my name is Nicholas Bloom, a leading product management for WebRTC. I'm super happy to be here with my two colleagues. So I'm uh, Per, uh, per Ogren, and I'm uh, a software engineer uh, in WebRTC, and uh, I work with front-end uh, audio processing, like echo cancellation, noise suppression, and other stuff. And I'm Justin Uberti. Um, it's great to be here today. I think the fantastic quality of the presentations is uh, just uh, phenomenal for this event, and I and particularly enjoyed that most recent presentation by Philip Hankey. <laughs> I, I actually learned a few things, so that's, good. that's really good. <laughs> That was great, um, and we are here to present you basically a little bit from where we see the WebRTC is at the moment, and these are the stats, so we are actually not getting uh, to start talking about GET stats, but the stats that we see uh, in Chrome mainly from users who, who opt in to provide this data to us. Um, we are bringing up some news on, on what's coming up in the next quarter, and then Per will do basically a deep dive into audio processing uh, pipeline in, uh, in WebRTC. So, um, where are we now? In, uh, in June, we celebrated basically the fifth year of, of WebRTC. So, in uh, June 1st, 2011, our colleague Harald published um, on an ITF list an announcement that we're releasing WebRTC into open source world. Uh, and we're going to start defining a set of APIs on top of those to, to grow an ecosystem uh, and unlock basically real-time communication uh, for apps and services. Um, and this is what we see now. Uh, this was just announced last week at, at Chrome Dev Summit, that there are about two billion uh, Chrome browsers across uh, web and mobile out there. And those are all enabled with WebRTC, right? So these are endpoints uh, that are out there that can be used. But additionally, there are hundreds of millions um, of endpoints from, uh, from Firefox and from Edge out there. And just recently, uh, a group of open source uh, people have enabled WebKit uh, with Open Web RTC, uh, and that makes personally me very happy because I see basically the open source community uh, taking up the responsibility on enabling even further endpoints of Web RTC. But those web points are not only uh, those endpoints are not only there um, being Web RTC enabled; they are being used, right? And the, the, those are really active. So this is what we see um, from from the Chrome usage only. Um, so there is uh, about one billion combined audio. Uh, and video minutes per week uh, happening inside of Chrome. And this is um, around 2,000 years, basically, uh, worth of audio-video communication, which is just happening in Chrome. And this is happening by, by the services that you create, basically, and by all the users that make use of WebRTC. But it's not only audio and video communication. This is often maybe forgotten. There's also the data channel. Uh, and I think it's very impressive to see that we have basically also per week one petabyte of data which is being transferred over the data channel. It's, it's very seldom basically that I talk about petabytes and network uh, at the same time. So um, I think this is very impressive. Um, and it makes basically up 0.1% uh, of all HTTP traffic in Chrome. Um, yeah, fractions and climbing, so. Yeah, which is continuously growing. Um, and I think you showed this uh, after the I.O., how we see basically uh, a very nice growth here. Um, yeah, and these are not being used by one company or one service. Uh, so Sahi is tracking those for us, and there are more than 1,200 uh, projects and companies that make use of, of WebRTC. And I think this really shows the success of, of bringing the technology out to open source and enabling and, and making it royalty-free from the codex, that every Kali basically can build on top of the stack uh, and can be enabled uh, by adding real-time communications or any kind of peer-to-peer -peer traffic uh, to their service. Uh, and this is happening globally. It's, it's not happening in a few selected uh, countries, so this is uh, the Google Trends that we see from search uh, for, for the term WebRTC. And you see basically that, uh, that the US is uh, not even in the, in the top five or top seven here. Uh, and it's also continu continuously growing uh, with some outliers in here. Um, but this is basically how we observe how, how WebRTC is being grown and how, how the ecosystem around this from a developer perspective is also growing a lot. It's interesting, right? China on, on first place here, South Korea second, Taiwan third, and uh, yeah, Sweden on fourth, right? That's great. <laughs> it's not the WebRTC team that's having something running here. <laughs> 
so what are the recent improvements that I want to um, just basically outline here um, that, that we have invested in and what we have launched basically in the, in the last uh, six months? Um, just in the, in the last presentation uh, from FIPO, we have seen something about, about BWE, bandwidth estimation, uh, video codecs, uh, audio performance that we are heavily investing in, um, and some changes and additions in Chrome. So the two seconds uh, is what was needed beginning of this year in Chrome to ramp up to a one megabit per second video stream. Uh, and we have switched uh, the, the algorithm or the, the mechanism to an unsensored only uh, bandwidth estimation. That means the whole logic for, for the uh, bandwidth estimation uh, sits on only one side and depends on feedbacks it gets from the other side. And this actually um, resulted into a reduction to 650 milliseconds that we are now at uh, for ramping up to one megabit per second. And uh, yeah, it's been used for various services, right? Additionally, uh, we, are, we are working on including audio um, also in, in the bandwidth estimation and also the headers basically to make it more robust. Um, and uh, we have also improved uh, the competition for TCP streams. So if you happen to be in a meeting that you're very bored of it and you start watching your YouTube video maybe uh, at the same time, uh, this will not ruin your audio quality uh, anymore. Yeah, and we did what we committed to do, right? So we, we added H.264 in Chrome. Um, we, we make use of open H.264 for on the encoding side. Uh, we continue to use uh, the libffm pack uh, that there is, uh, has always been in Chrome for, for decoding side. Uh, but I've recently been pinged by folks who've, who've observed basically uh, inside of Chrome that uh, the performance for H.264 um, it, it needs less, or less computing requirements, basically. And the reason for this is that on certain platforms, we also have uh, enabled, basically, hardware codecs uh, to make it more efficient, uh, uh, to not create much heat, to not switch on the fan, um, if services want to make use of this. Um, yeah, uh, but we've not only enabled uh, H.264, we've also enabled VP9. Uh, and Vidal, I think, uh, video gave a great uh, presentation about this. But um, what I want to show you here um, is basically a comparison. Um, though these are two streams that we have here, a VP8 stream uh, with 900 kilobits uh, encoded and a VP9 uh, stream with 650 uh, running at full HD. And I'm playing this video now. And I have the slider here, basically, where I can slide from left to right. Uh, so uh, this is Marco and Jackie. Uh, Marco is VP8 at the moment, Jackie VP9. Um, there's no difference, right? And, uh, and this is great. This is, this is the greatness of, of, uh, of one of the great things of VP9. Um, you have 30% less bits, but you have the same quality. Um, and yes, it is more expensive. Uh, and we have enabled in software in Chrome, uh, AppRTC demo, AppRTC, I mean, uh, uh, has it enabled as a default codec right now. Um, and we're looking on how to bring it basically into mobile. Um, and uh, it is more complex, it is more expensive on these platforms. Um, but on low resolutions or on low bit rates, it's actually, it can be run on mobile. And this is where the advantage lies if you want to bring basically uh, VP9 or, or, or video to mobile for, for low bit rates or where, where you don't have the bandwidth available. You can run basically VP9 uh, at smaller resolutions. It works there fine on mobile. And you can make use basically of this uh, additional efficiency that you have uh, uh, in the encoding and the 30% less bits. Yeah, but it's not only video, it's also audio that we are investing in. So Opus uh, is the preferred audio codec. Yes, Isaac is still there. Uh, we work hard on making Opus uh, more efficient um, uh, and to improve the quality for, uh, for speech, but also um, for uh, content beyond voice, basically. Um, but an, an additional focus that we are having is basically to, to continue to work uh, on bringing it to the ultra low bit rate, as we call it, so at 12 kilobits and below, uh, that you can run an audio call maybe on an edge network uh, on mobile or on a Wi-Fi where you have a, a lot of varying bandwidth happening, uh, and they're really to be able to, to ramp up the quality. 
Um, what just has been launched in, in M54 uh, is a new screen sharing picker. So we added uh, tab sharing uh, to Chrome, uh, which servers can make use of. Um, and with this, basically, we took the opportunity to completely uh, revamp the UX of, of the picker. Uh, and we enabled audio sharing as well. So you will, if you want to make use of it, you can basically share the audio uh, from the tab as well. Uh, and the, the picker is now separated in these three different tabs. So you have your entire screen, you select your application window, uh, or you can select uh, just a specific tab that you want to share. And uh, I think this is also interesting if you don't want to share basically your complete tab list uh, on the top if you have many tabs open. You can test this, there's a URL there. Uh, you have to install like a, a custom extension for this. Uh, and if, if you visit this URL basically, you, you can test uh, the tab sharing and the audio sharing. Uh, and what has been mentioned already before uh, in the great presentation is um, that we have added uh, screen capture to Android, uh, and this has been just launched or is being launched, but it's already being uh, used. So for those of you who have a Pixel phone and don't know how to use it and call the, the help uh, hotline, you can actually start sharing your screen. Uh, so it's, it's, part, it's part of the, of the Pixel launch. Yeah, and not, not all WebRTC traffic, uh, or not, not all administrators are always happy uh, to open up all their network, right? So especially in an enterprise environment, uh, often UDP is blocked or UDP is limited uh, to the specific set of uh, ports. Uh, and what has just been enabled is a Chrome policy, basically, in which you can uh, define this port range and can limit it to a very specific range, which the administrator uh, has opened in the firewall. Uh, and uh, the folks are working at the moment on bringing this into cPanel uh, to be able to, to roll this out uh, into a managed corporate network. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Justin talking about uh, the upcoming work. All right, thanks, Niklas. So there's a bunch of stuff that we could really spend a lot of time getting into details on. Um, we could talk all about all the things that Philip brought up in his presentation. Unfortunately, we're not going to cover all that today because I want to make sure we can leave time for a pair to get into all the details of how the WebRTC audio stack works. But what I really want to do is talk about some of the top pain points, things that you have come to us and said, you guys really need to fix this, please help, in the status of these issues. So let's get into that. So these are some of the things that have been identified as like the top pain points of you know, people who are deploying applications today with WebRTC and what is really not working. Like, I think for the most part, WebRTC is getting toward this sort of mission accomplished, 1.0 is done uh, standpoint, but there's still a few places where things are just not quite there yet. And so one of the places in particular is this case in corporate networks. Nicholas talked about what we could do where port ranges need to be basically restricted because the firewall config on the local network is only allowing WebRTC out of a certain number of ports, and we need to make sure WebRTC honors that. So we have that in WebRTC today, but one of the things that we're still seeing missing is cases where enterprises, banks, corporations are not letting any UDP out of the network. They're forcing everything to go through a proxy. And WebRTC will always take some quality hit in this case because we're forcing media to go over TCP and traverse the proxy. But what we know right now is that some of these cases, you even have to log into the proxy. And even though web traffic works, the WebRTC traffic doesn't work because right now, Chrome doesn't understand how to route WebRTC traffic through proxies that require authentication. And this is like a real problem. We've heard from many customers where like, customers require this to work on their network, and we just can't satisfy it. Uh, there's a bug right now that's open. has over 100 stars. Um, the reasons for this are deep and complex. I won't get into uh, all the detail, but the basic thing is that the web stack has its own set of credentials and cache of these sort of things. WebRTC needs to have access to that without polluting the state of the actual web network stack. But we have like, some work going on here, a collaboration between the WebRTC team, the Chrome networking team, and we expect we'll have something you can start playing with by the end of this quarter. So we know this is a top issue. We're making real progress on it. Look for something that can actually work very soon. Next, media reliability. This is one of the other things we hear time and time again. You know, we say, WebRTC is done. It works. It just works for the most part. And we still hear cases where someone says, well, my customer was using this, they were using a Mac, and we didn't get any audio from their mic. Uh, we told them to restart their browser, and when they restarted their browser, everything worked. Well, it's good there's only really some solution, but that's really not what we want to have happen. We want this to you know, just work all the time. And it turns out this is like really complicated due to a way Chrome is designed. 
where all the interaction with the system media, you know, audio and video subsystems is managed by the Chrome browser process. You know, for those not familiar with the architecture of Chrome, every tab, every website has its own renderer process that does all the layout and drawing of the, the, the actual HTML, but then all the interaction with the system is done by this single browser process. The problem is that browser process lives for the entire time Chrome is up, and so like, if something gets wedged, you know, there's some driver issue, some bad interaction with like, you know, something in uh, you know, audio core, whatever core audio, leaking resources, the only way to get to a good state is to take down the entire browser. That's kind of frustrating. The other thing is that the browser process does a ton of other things, not just all the media interactions, but anything where it basically has to interact with the OS has to go through this browser process. So there are cases where things can get blocked uh, in the browser process due to some of the other handling that's going on, and for something that's trying to do 30 FPS streaming video, like that can cause like, these very small glitches that can lead to render lags, or even cases where like, it causes echo cancellation problems because the timing gets messed up a little bit. So we are going to fix this because of a new architecture that Chrome has called Mojo. And Mojo is basically a way for us to take a lot of these stuff that we have for doing specific tasks and moving it out into its own process that C Chrome can then spin up on demand. So what we're going to do is take all of our interactions with the audio subsystem, core audio, and, and, and then like, and move that out to its own process. Also do the same thing with video device enumeration and uh, capture, move that out to its own process. That means these processes will only run when there's actually a WebRTC session going. Uh, meaning that that code only is loaded when necessary. These subsystems, we can then bounce them. If uh, you know, someone says, oh, my tab didn't work, whatever, uh, you, know, you can just close the tab and restart it and everything should be in good state. We probably should have many fewer cases where this actually will happen because we don't have this long, long running you know, uh, interaction with the system, which is what we believe is, is the underlying cost of some of these things. Every time, basically, you're closing a tab, you're getting a whole fresh new start. And since this stuff is all happening in its own process with its own like, main thread, uh, the other stuff happening for the browser process will not interfere with the timing of all these critical real-time events that we have for audio and video. Um, and, and perhaps best of all, uh, a bad driver with a webcam will not cause the entire browser to explode. So not so upside. Downside, well, this is a significant, significant re-engineering. Uh, it's going to take some time to get through all this, but we're hoping that this quarter we can have uh, the video capture stuff pulled out to its own process. Uh, and then next year, you know, achieve the same for audio. So uh, we'll see how quickly we can actually complete this work. But we think this will kind of help us to get from like two nines to like you know three or four nines in terms of actual audio and video reliability, which will make a huge, uh, huge difference in like us being able to say WebRTC just works. Um, screen sharing. Screen sharing works reasonably well right now if you're sharing static content, a document, a spreadsheet, etc. However, lots of times now people are trying to share an application, a game, or even share like a, a YouTube video. And uh, basically you're, you, you're given two choices at this point in time. You either have a very slow kind of jerky video which everyone kind of sees on the screen and like gets uh, you know, sad about, or you have your fan spin up because you're trying to basically scrape the screen 30 times a second and the attendant sort of CPU overhead. So what we've got now is a new thing based on DirectX on Windows, a corresponding one on Mac, that's uh, much more optimized. Uh, it, it takes out some of the things that were slowing us down in the old version, and basically this will be engaged when we try to set the frame rate for the uh, screen capture to 15 or 30 FPS. That will allow things to be much, much more efficient. Uh, and this will basically open the door for us doing actual uh, streaming of games. We know there's a lot of people using WebRTC for that, as well as for videos. Um, there's still some work we're going to have to do on the actual uh, encoding side for uh, you know, encoding of screen share to kind of keep up with this. You know, scraping is one part of it. That's the first part we'll work on. Then we'll have some stuff coming to allow us to basically make sure that we have really good image quality uh, for, the, for these streams. But we expect to see some significant improvements uh, in the next quarter or so. And lastly, we hear often that people are trying to make WebRTC work on IoT device or some other thing where it says, I just want to do a data channel. I don't want to have you know, all the video processing stuff because my app doesn't need that. And uh, in order to make WebRTC actually build for my configuration, I had to go there and like, slash and hack in order to get this thing to actually even compile. Um, and part of the way things are the way they are is kind of WebRTC kind of grew up organically and it was kind of moved into Chrome and we had all these sort of things where there are some stuff that's kind of interwoven. Well, we have these same needs too. We need to make WebRTC work in a lot of different places. We're going to kind of chop back some of these dependencies 
eliminate the places where we have things that are cyclical and basically allow for a lot easier customiza customization through the, our GN build config without having to go and hack and actually change the source code. So uh, this will be a multi-quarter effort, but the uh, things we can expect by the end of this is you can have a build of WebRTC that might be voice only, it might be data channel only, or if you want to have specific codecs removed or add your own codecs uh, through sort of a, uh, some of the APIs we have similar to our way we can inject a video codec, you'll be able to do that. So this sort of makes some of the maintenance cost of kind of integrating and customizing WebRTC much lower. So these are all things that we've heard of, of like this, like most of the small stuff in WebRTC has been taken care of. Now these are just some of the few remaining big things and we're making really good progress in these areas and we expect to have some really tangible stuff to show in the next quarter or two. And with that, I'll turn it on to a deep dive into WebRTC audio for Pear. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the audio processing development that we do uh, in WebRTC at Google. And um, um, it will be maybe not super deep dive, but uh, the deep dive part uh, we can take at the Q&A afterwards. Um, so we write the audio processing algorithms, we maintain the code, uh, handle incoming issues, and uh, maintain the pipeline, the audio processing pipeline, and uh, write a lot of tests. And the work that we do, uh, we do a lot in response to issues that we see with the audio processing, both in software, but also uh, in the hardware audio processing that, that we utilize. But uh, we do the work with the long-term improvements in mind, so, so we, we are able to do that as well. Uh, and I'm going to uh, go through the software audio processing pipeline that we have in WebRTC. And uh, I will go through how we utilize hardware uh, audio processing port support that we, we have available on mobile devices. And I will go through the tuning process uh, that is uh, done in order to, to tune this hardware processing uh, on, uh, on mobile devices. And that's Im quite important to to understand that uh, in order to uh, see why we are seeing the issues that we are seeing uh, on, uh, with the hardware audio processing support on mobiles, which I will go through after that. And I will go th through the solutions that we apply to, to handle this and uh, the ongoing work that we uh, have uh, on the software audio processing. Um, so this is what the, uh, our audio processing pipeline looks like. And this is the standard functionality. Th there is also experimental functionality, but I won't uh, add, uh, discuss that uh, in, in this talk. Um, and uh, uh, the audio processing uh, pipeline basically uh, uh, solely resides inside the audio processing module, which is a module inside WebRTC. And this uh, receives the audio coming from the network, from the decoder, uh, and uh, and uh, analyzes that and passes that on to the loudspeaker. So the loudspeaker is the small box up into the rightmost corner, upper rightmost corner. And uh, then it receives the audio from the microphone, which is the small box in the lower uh, rightmost corner, and uh, uh, processes that and uh, passes the processed audio on to the coder, which passes it on to the network. And the functionality that is in place here is uh, is functionality that is required in order to be able to, to have a successful VoIP call, and also functionality that improves the uh, quality of the audio beyond that. And uh, we have uh, basically two types of components, processing components inside the audio processing module. Most of them operate in the subband domain in, on frequency bands. And then we have some that operate in the full band uh, signal. And in order to provide the signals, the subband signals to the subband processing components, we have these blocks which uh, do down mixing when, when that is needed, resampling and band splitting into these frequency bands, and then uh, merging of the bands uh, and uh, uh, up mixing whenever needed. And the first of the processing that is being done on the microphone signal is uh, the high pass filter. And the purpose of that is to, pr is to provide a decent signal for the other uh, modules to operate on. So for instance, an echo canceller ha have quite big problems with handling uh, signals with a DC offset. So, uh, uh, and the same uh, is the case for the noise suppression. So these modules typically need to take, ta take care of that anyway. And uh, that's uh, 
but, but in this case, it's taken care of, of by the high pass filter. And that will also have, um, have, uh, uh, have the task of removing electrical hum, which is picked up by the microphone. And then we have the uh, level control, or the gain control, uh, which uh, controls the level of uh, the output uh, of the audio processing module. So uh, the task is to uh, ensure that the output has a decent level. Uh, and there are four variants of that. Uh, and the, uh, the rightmost box here is uh, the analog adaptive gain control, which adjusts the analog uh, gain, uh, the analog microphone gain. And then we have two variants of the digital adaptive gain control, which are the residing in the, in, in the uh, two left boxes. And uh, uh, they adjust the digital level of the, of the signal. And then there is also another mode which, uh, which applies the fixed gain in a controlled manner. And uh, then we have the echo canceller. So the purpose of that is to remove any echoes originated from the loudspeaker signal, and that is uh, and uh, that is being picked up by the microphone. And uh, the echo cancel analyzes the signal going out for rendering by the microphone and uh, predicts and removes uh, any echoes. I have the noise suppressor. Uh, and the task of the noise suppressor is to reduce the stationary noise uh, to in order to increase the listener comfort and decrease listener fatigue. And then we have a module, uh, a component called transient suppression, which uh, have the task of removing any uh, uh, sounds originating from keystrokes. Yeah. And finally, we have the output signal analysis component, which provides information about the outgoing audio uh, to other modules inside uh, web RTC. And that information could be uh, things like signal level and uh, the presence of voice. And uh, whenever, uh, on mobile platforms, uh, we, we try to utilize whatever hardware audio processing functionality uh, uh, that is available. And to WebRTC, the hardware audio processing uh, uh, is seen as a layer that is in between this, the, the loudspeaker and the microphone and, and the audio processing module. And what we do is that if a certain functionality is available in hardware, we turn off the corresponding functionality inside the, the software audio processing module. So for instance, if hardware echo cancellation is available, we don't do software echo cancellation. And the reason why we do this is that if the hardware audio processing functionality is properly tuned and optimized, it should uh, provide better functionality since the software audio processing functionality that we have is generic, so it should work on all kinds of hardware. Uh, but if you tune for a specific hardware, you typically uh, can get better results. And also, the, uh, the functionality can be customized to the hardware. For instance, if you have a multi-microphone uh, hardware, uh, you can use a multi-microphone noise suppression. And uh, potentially, it should uh, give, have lower battery and CPU usage. And uh, for the echo canceller, it's... Uh, uh, it's typically a really big advantage of doing that in the hardware layer since there are no render effects in the echo path as seen by the loudspeaker. And that is typically not the case for the uh, software echo canceller. Um, and in order to, uh, uh, in order to, to understand uh, uh, how uh, uh, the hardware audio processing functionality behaves in practice. It's quite important to, to know how it is typically being tuned. Uh, so if we have a device, a hardware, uh, a, a mobile device that is to be tuned, uh, that is typically placed in a silent room, and the software client is installed into the device. And this software client communicates with another client that is uh, located in another room, uh, a control room. And uh, that tuning device also have the capability of playing out audio in the silent room and picking up and, and capturing any audio that is present in the silent room. And the silent room is where the device to be tuned is located. And uh, the tuning is done in such a manner so that a number of scenarios are, are uh, created uh, where there are different kind of noise, noises being played out in the silent room and, 
and there are different kind of uh, uh, conversational scenarios with double talk, single talk. And uh, <coughs> for each of these scenarios, the audio that is received from the device being tuned is analyzed uh, uh, together with the audio that is captured in that room. And based on this analysis, uh, a set of parameters, a new set of parameters for the device is computed. And those parameters are, are then uploaded to the device and the test is, the scenario is repeated. And this is done until uh, sufficient quality is achieved. And uh, this is a very time consuming process and uh, is done, typically done manually. And it's important to note that for the VoIP case, there is no standardized tuning client. But uh, FRTC Mobile can be used and have been used for this. And uh, it's quite important that for, for these devices, uh, the tuning is done including the network and the software client. So uh, uh, any kind of active software processing that is done in the client will affect the tuning, which means that the client used is really, really important to get a good tuning. So for instance, if a high pass filter is active in the client, that will affect the tuning. And <coughs> uh, also another thing with, with with the tuning of the hardware parameters is that each feature combination is stored as a separate profile inside the device. Uh, so if there are several features, for instance, typically there are the gain control and you have the echo cancellation, noise suppression, all combination of, uh, combinations of these need to be stored as a separate profile in the device. And this is quite error prone. So because for instance, if you update the echo cancellation parameters, based on, on some tuning, you need to make sure that you update all profiles where, where uh, the echo cancellation is active. And uh, that's quite easy to miss. And indeed, we, 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 have, we are seeing issues with the hardware uh, audio processing support. Uh, and it's important to note that this is beyond the control of, of WebRTC. Uh, so if we choose to, uh, so we can basically choose to use the hardware audio processing functionality or not, uh, but we cannot make it work because that is in hardware. Uh, but we are still affected by by any issues that that, uh, that arise from the hardware audio processing. Uh, so the main issues we are seeing are with uh, tuning uh, or related to the tuning of the hardware processing. We see poor noise suppression, poor neon transparency, echo leakage, poor bandwidth, and low signal levels. And then we have also issues with broken hardware API support. Um, and, and this is also uh, uh, solely something which is in the, in the hardware and not in web RTC. So for instance, if we try to explicitly turn on the gain control in hardware that breaks the hardware echo canceller. So if we try to turn on the gain controller, the hardware echo canceller starts leaking echoes. And similarly, we have seen that if we try to turn, turn off the hardware noise suppression, the, the, har the hardware echo canceller starts leaking echoes. And uh, we are also seeing issues with silently failing hardware. So we have, uh, we have one case where the echo canceller permanently stops working suddenly uh, after uh, uh, quite a while uh, have been being, uh, being fully working. And the only way to get it to work again is to make uh, a software reset. And similar, we are seeing uh, cases where we sometimes get silent microphone signals. And with WebRTC, don't get any notice of this happening. And I have some examples. <coughs> and this, uh, in this example, uh, uh, there is, this is from a scenario where there was uh, ec only echo coming from the loudspeaker and no near end signal. So everything though that was picked up by the microphone was echo. And uh, the hardware echo canceller was active, which meant that if it worked properly, the output of the hardware echo canceller should be silent or close to, close to silent. And uh, what is shown in these figures is that is the uh, to the left, we see the spectrogram of the microphone signal, and to the right, we see the waveform. And uh, this signal is not silent. And in this case, it was because we tried to turn off the hardware noise suppression, and that caused, caused this device to suddenly start leaking echoes. 
And what we see here is the leaked echoes. But if we, if we have the hardware noise suppression on, this doesn't happen, and we have a silent microphone signal, uh, well, a silent output of the ha hardware echo canceller. I have one more example where the capture level is low. This is also the spectrogram and the waveform from the, uh, from the microphone signal. And in this scenario, there was only near-end signal e uh, present, so no, uh, there was no echo present. And uh, uh, we couldn't get the signal to be uh, the signal to be picked up, uh, signal being picked up to be str stronger, to have a higher level than this one. And this is 16-bit uh, 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 integer range. So the, uh, the the figure basically shows what range would be possible, but but we couldn't get more, uh, and we couldn't get a higher level than this. And this has a severe impact of the of a conversation. Because when you send this to the other side, the other side will perceive this audio as being very, very low, which it is di digitally. Um, and we try to address this, of course. So one thing we do is to use allow and deny lists. So basically, we, we detect on the which platforms the hardware audio processing is, is OK to use. Uh, and uh, which pr um, platforms it is not OK. And, uh, uh, when it's not okay to use, we, we, we revert to using the software audio processing instead. But this is really hard to scale, and it's very, these lists are very hard to maintain. Basically, we need to test all devices where, where we do this. And it actually gives suboptimal performance uh, compared to the ideal case, because if the hardware would have been tuned properly, uh, we, we would have gotten better, we, we likely gotten better quality audio quality by using the hardware audio processing compared to using the software audio processing, which we, we need to do in these cases. So we also work with vendors in order to uh, ensure that the devices are properly tuned. And one thing we have planned there is uh, an objective evaluation tool based on AppRTC, AppRTC Mobile, which they can use to, to simplify the tuning process. And we uh, work on improving the software audio processing to ensure that uh, uh, when we need to, when, that when we don't use the, the hardware audio processing functionality, the difference in quality should be, uh, should not be noticeable when we fall back to using the software audio processing. Um, and we have some, some ongoing work on improving the software audio processing, and uh, the main work is being, uh, currently being done on the echo cancellation. We have uh, yeah, the, the figure here shows uh, shows uh, the uh, the major components of an echo canceller. There, there is a delay estimator, a linear adaptive filter, and a nonlinear <coughs> processor. And we have in place some uh, refinements of the adaptation of the uh, adaptive filter. And we have also robustified the delay estimator. And these two changes lead to more uh, robust echo cancellation behavior. And we have ongoing work of improving the echo removal and the, the, uh, uh, the transparency of the echo canceller. Um, what to do then is that we change the adaptation scheme for the linear adaptive filter. And we also change the way that we compute the suppression gains that are applied in the nonlinear processor. And we also make the interaction between the submodules inside the echo canceller, in, in canceller more, uh, more integrated so that they speak more together with each other. And uh, probably this will end up uh, with a lower comp uh, with a comp solution that is has a lower complexity. And it should be more future-proof for upcoming uh, uh, changes uh, uh, to the pipeline. And uh, it should be modular and more easily to easy to maintain. And the related thing that we are working on is gain control. Uh, so one thing we have in place is a new digital uh, adaptive gain control mode, which is able to operate on lower level signals. Um, uh, but we're also working on analog adaptive gain control improvements, which will affect the echo canceller performance. Uh, and what we are doing there is, uh, is to ensure that they have a better uh, that we better handle the case when the echo is saturated in the microphone signal. And this has a, uh, the, the way that the analog adaptive gain control handles this has an impact 
on, uh, on how well the echo counselor performs. And also we are modifying the way that, uh, uh, that we detect soft saturation when we have soft wet saturation in the microphone. And we also add more integration between uh, how the analog adaptive gain control behaves uh, uh, together with the echo counselor. And that is really important since the analog adaptive gain controller uh, constitutes uh, a big uh, artificial echo source, uh, a big source of artificial echo pass changes as for the echo counselor. So anything that that does is affects what the, what the echo counselor does. Uh, so we are working on echo cancellation and gain control, but we are doing much other stuff as well. Uh, but uh, we won't go through that today. <laughs>